and uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, this is the uh, presentation about Assail 2, a new paradigm for amateur radio. Uh, for those who are not regular AMSAT uh, attendees, um, uh, we, like every other part of amateur radio or every, every, every science thing, we have lots of jargon, TLAs. Um, one of our favorite TLAs are the Earth orbiting, low Earth orbiting, which is that one very close to the Earth, LEOs. Then we have uh, MEOs, um, which are further out but get into the radiation bolt, uh, belts, and then HEOs and GEOs. So what, what we've got uh, in GEO is all your broadcast spacecraft, which appear to stay stationary in one spot of the sky. Of the sky. So that's what a sail 2 is going to be doing, sitting there. Um, and it's going to be very easy because once you put your dish in the right spot, we'll talk about that later, but once you put your dish in the right spot, unless your wife goes and knocks it when she's doing the gardening, um, or <laughs> <laughs> um, that's what's happened to me, um, you, you won't have to touch it again. It's going to be that easy. Anyway, a bit of the history, timeline. Um, we met the Qataris uh, out in, uh, out in Qatar, well, out in Friedrichshafen and in Qatar. Um, uh, in 2012. It seems that the mission's been going on for a long while, getting prepared. Most launches do seem to move to the right, um, but we, are, I, we really are there. It would have been really wonderful to be able to demonstrate it working at this colloquium. Um, come back next year. It, it, will, it will be ready by then. Uh, so uh, launch on a SpaceX Falcon 9. Um, and for us, as well as the commercial uh, transponders, the commercial use it's getting, they have provided us with, will be providing us with two, two transponders, um, both of which are S-band uplinks and X-band downlinks. Don't be frightened about microwaves, they, they don't, can't hurt you. Um, two linear transponders with 15 years of life, it says. Um, a bit of history about the platform, it's been built by uh, Melco, which is a Mitsubishi um, company in Japan. Uh, so they've all been successful so far, so we have every reason to believe this one will be successful. Uh, the public la uh, launch plans, if you go on any internet website and put SL2 launch date, you'll get something that's a bit like this. It says fourth quarter 2018, and it describes it's going to be launched from Cape Canaveral um, and cover um, uh, Qatar and the surrounding areas. Of course, Broadcast satellites have very um, have dishes or have antennas. They don't have dishes, but they have antennas where they point just to small areas of the ground. This, uh, our transponders that will have global beams, which means it will cover the whole of the Earth underneath the, where the spacecraft is. In fact, the coverage is that, will be that. Um, most coverage maps you see for broadcast TV uh, uh, satellites, if you go online, you find them. They're normally only showing down to about 5 or 10 degrees of elevation because it's only mad people like radio amateurs who want to go, well, how far away can I be? Or want they'll, they'll, What I know we'll find is people right on the edge here going to the tops of mountains where they can <coughs> see below zero degrees, and, and it's going to be quite fun. Um, so... Uh, so the cover this coverage map is down to zero degrees. So you can see Brazil, um, part of Brazil is covered. I'm not sure what that country, that, is that French Guiana? Small one up there, just about there. Um, and then all the way across Africa, uh, right over to uh, uh, Malaysia uh, and India as well. So unfortunately we miss out North America. Sorry, oh, Joe. Well, I, I see I can try to give it a shot from Signal Hill and Newton. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if excuse me, and if we're uh, if we have any viewers in Australia, I apologise to you as well. Um, uh, yeah. So the transponders, we've got two transponders. Uh, there's one designed for narrowband operation, and one designed for what five years ago, six years ago, we called wideband. Um, the narrowband one is 250 kilohertz wide, and the wideband one, as you can see, is 8 megs wide. So this spacecraft will be 
providing eight and a quarter megahertz of spectrum where you will, you will know it's like having the ionosphere switched on. Exactly the same. You know, it it's not going to change. There are still some unknowns. Going back to the antennas on board, it, it's, there are horns. So um, they're supposed to be global beams, but w how flat in terms of the beam width and the radiation pattern they are at the edges, uh, I'm sure somebody knows, but we don't yet. So one of the, th the interesting things is going to be very early on to characterize what it means and what power levels are, are going to be needed. So um, say 2.4 gigs up, 10.5 gigs down. Uh, we then get into the really uh, uh, nitty gritty of its right hand circular polarization for the uplink and for the downlink it's vertical or horizontal depending on which transponder you're using. Uh, a block diagram Again, it's all very secret, hush-hush, commercial, NDA. So this is a very high-level diagram, but you can see there are um, uh, a redundant spare set of receivers, uh, S-band receivers, going through a switching matrix to CWT1 or 2. They're actually one of their spares. All these satellites carry, uh, I don't know, actually, the number on this, I think it's 32 uh, traveling wave tubes, which they can switch in and out of service. I think out of those 32, um, something like eight are reckoned to be on, on orbit spares and we're using two of them. So although the service, service, service life of the spacecraft may be 15 years, if they have really bad luck and blow up some of their TWTs, we might find that we're switched off because we're just using their spare TWTs. But let's look at the positive side. We've got two transponders here. Uh, the TWTs are 100 watts RF output probably downrated a bit because they're operating slightly off, uh, off their design frequency, um, but uh, 60, 70 watts is probably the RF level. So um, S-band in, uh, mixers, amplifiers, bandpass filters, and then to the transmit horn. Uh, talking about the narrowband transponder, I've described 250 kilohertz bandwidth. It's non-inverting. Most amateur satellites are inverting, uh, but we haven't got Doppler here to worry about. Or actually, um, there is a question as to how much Doppler there is on a geostationary satellite when it's moving around. It would be interesting to measure it. It will be interesting to measure well, it. Every time the moon, moon goes around, it'll pull it up a little bit as well. Um, so there's a, kind of, there's a, a, yep. there's a month cycle, and, there's, uh, and then there, there are short-term cycles. Just, just, just from the general geosynchronous satellite, so I presume this won't be no different. No different. Yeah. Um, so we're assuming uh, 250 kilohertz, um, that could have 50, ki uh, sorry, 50 QSOs and 100 users. As I say, the link budgets are all a bit nominal. So when it says there a 90 centimeter dish at the edge of coverage, the 75 centimeter dish right in the middle of the coverage, um, I wouldn't say they're guesses, but don't hold us to that. Um, downlink polarization is vertical and the uplink is right hand circular. I've said all that. Uh, so, uh, yes, 10 watts, 5 to 10 watts to a 22 dB gain antenna is reckoned to be what you will need. I personally think that's very pessimistic, but w we shall see. I, I think you won't need that amount of power or that size of antenna. Although, having said that, uh, I mean, a 22 dB antenna at at S band is, is only a 75 centimeter dish or a sky dish or something like that, a big, the big sky dish. Uh, sorry. Uh, we haven't really got much in the way of band plans yet. So, this is a proposed band plan to start with. Um, you'll note that it hasn't got FT8 in it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a glaring omission which obviously will be corrected. Um, but it's not, not, it's not uh, identified. Um, what we have got are beacons at the top and bottom of the pass band. Um, previous uh, satellites in the P phase three range, that they were the GTO ones, the high Earth orbit ones, um, had a 400 BPSK, uh, 400 bar BPSK, or BPS, BPSK telemetry beacon, and all that was generated on board the spacecraft. This we can't do because it's just simply, simply, 
It is only a bent pipe transponder, so there will be beacons transmitted up from Qatar um, to the spacecraft, which will appear to us as users as a, a top be a lower beacon, and a, that's very confusing having the lower beacon at, top, at the top of the screen, and uh, at the top and the bottom of the transponder. Uh, that will carry data and up, update and information. A uh, picture of nice dishes. You have to have some nice dishes. Uh, Qatar is, everybody I hope knows where, where it is in the Arabian Gulf. It's a bit that sticks out about halfway up the, in the middle on the left-hand side. Uh, and that's Peter, for those of you who have not met him, um, at the site of a 2.4 metre dish. Um, that's just a detail of the radio shack or part of the radio shack that they're building out there. The TS-2000 makes it out there. Um, and both the, well, the TS-2000 obviously for the narrowband section and then there's a whole bit for uh, the TV transponder which Dave will be talking about momentarily. Uh, so there's a ground segment out there. One of the things, again, the experience that we've had on previous uh, high orbiting, high Earth orbiting spacecraft coming out of Germany is that they have a, a, a system called LILA, which basically means that if you're, if you're transmitting too much power to the spacecraft, if your signal is too strong, um, this n nasty noise will come and bleep on top of your um, signal, uh, which will encourage you to shut down or turn the, turn the wick down. Um, Again, that's historically been actually built into the spacecraft system, but again, we can't do that. So they're building, <coughs> excuse me, a LILA 2 on, at the ground station, which will scan across the band, find people. You know, if I'm transmitting too much power, it will come and. I'm, uh, it, 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 is it a siren? I'm not actually sure what the noise is, but it's a fairly evil noise, um, uh, which will encourage you to turn the wick down. That, I have to say, is only available on the narrowband transponder. Um, so the, the beacon that I've just mentioned, phase three format at both ends of the passband. Um, yes, the uh, interesting point there is transmissions outside the passband are not permitted. Please, when you see the transponder passband is 250 kilohertz, please don't try and go down the edges. Um, well, you will, I know, but don't. Um, to see how close the, the, because actually you'll be outside our band in some cases, so it's not a good idea. Um, uh, and that's describing, uh, do we have a German speaker here? Could somebody please say what the a acronym is in German? No? Okay. Power limiting uh, visualization. Yeah. I, I was hoping somebody would say it in, ger in, a, in the German language. Thank you. Which is, I'm Dutch, but yeah, well, near enough. Um, <coughs> so that's a, a picture of some of the hardware that w they're using to make this work. And uh, Howard G6LVB has been involved with some of it. So we know the software is going to work very well. Now, um, this is going to be a very quick run through of what you need or might need to use some ideas of what to use for your segment. Uh, your ground segment um, to receive both narrowband and wideband. But again, I'm treading on Dave's toes a bit, so I'll be a little careful. Um, for the narrowband, we've talked about a dish and then um, a down converter or an LMB, uh, which will down convert the signal from 10 gigs to 1.4 uh, gigs or some number like that. At that, at that point, or around there, you can just use a, a, a fun cube dongle or actually any other sort of RTL type dongle and that will probably have enough gain. Of course, the um, normal uh, LMB is designed for an output between 1.2 to 1 1.2. 950 to 2150. 950 to 2150, thank you. Um, so it will be operating out of spec, but the, the, the ones that have been tested seem to work well enough. Uh, that's really the descri that's just what I've described. Uh, you need some way to power the LMB um, and to switch it from vertical to horizontal. Um, if you want to get involved in transmitting, there are various ways of doing that with uh, using an existing VHF or a UHF transceiver. 
and up and down converters are becoming available. Um, this is talk showing the, this Optima, uh, Oct Octagon o Optima LMB. Uh, it's particularly good. There are variations of it now, but it's, it's particularly good because of the, the oscillator is a PLL? Yes. PLL type, which is stable enough just for narrowband operations. Uh, but there are ways of enhancing that because you can lock the oscillator as well to a uh, GPS lock or anything you might have. Uh, that's the uh, a prototype of the up and down converter that AMSAT DL are producing. Or oh, sorry, the up converter only. Or will be. Um, high power at 2.4 gigs is not that hard to come by. Uh, there's a famous a guy in the, in the States called Pyro Joe, who always seems to have these, <coughs> have these uh, amplifiers available. Um, I, I bought one recently at about that price from him, and it arrived amazingly overnight, even though we don't have any trade, free trade agreement with America. It doesn't seem to stop this stuff coming in. <laughs> um, uh, S-band uplink antennas, well, find, find a dish in a scrapyard somewhere. Or, um, and you can m actually make the helix feed, or if you've got an old G3 RUH dish, some of us ha have those left over from AO40 days, uh, you know, a small dish like that, uh, with, the, with a, pa a patch type of feed in it, or you can make a helix. I mean, really, a piece of printed circuit board, punch a hole in it, put an end type on, wind a helix, three and a half turns, something like that, stick it in, it will, it, that will illuminate a dish very well, or well enough anyway. Um, there are all-in-one solutions coming, DB6NT is, is rumoured to be producing uh, 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 LMBs with the right IFs, um, and also an up converter, although I've not seen that on their, sh on their website yet. So, um, from me <coughs> this is almost my last slide. Um, before I hand over, but we've got to have some do's and don'ts. Um, obviously, this is going to be a tremendous, uh, have tremendous functionality for us as radio amateurs, but we've got to respect it, because there are, I'm sure, in CATA going to be two big switches, you know, on, off, uh, and we don't want it to be switched to the off position because of what's, what we have been doing with their transponder. Um, how it's going to work in practice, we don't know, but it's certainly going to change uh, IOTA and SOTA and every other OTA um, when we can just take a box and go and sit on an island or on the top of a hill or do whatever else we do on 80 metres. We can do it via here. Um, it's going to be amazing. It, to me, it's just going to change things. But um, the do's and don'ts, um, won't go into too much of the detail, but the key one is don't, don't run too much power, as well as everything else. Are you doing preparations or am I? OK. Um, so what can we do before it's launched? Well, those who want to go out and play in the garden, get a, uh, um, your dish will need to point to 26 degrees east, um, which is not very far away from where the sky uh, satellites are, the Astra satellites are at 28.2, our spacecraft is going to be at 26. Uh, uh, usefully there are already th three spacecraft at that position. So if you have uh, TV receiving equipment, um, you can literally take a set-top box, put in the right numbers, that's not a sky, di that's not a sky box but a free-to-air um, uh, digital set top box, put in the right numbers, and then spend some happy times trying to find exactly the right spot in the sky. But you can do it because there is already, uh, s there are already down signals being downlinked, and we've been doing it with an 80 centimetre dish, and you get lots of Arabic program, uh, which is different to uh, what we get here normally. So that's the work that can be done now, and um, you can prepare for, for, the, for the launch. Wideband transponder, over to Dave Crump.
Thank you. Is that working, Wood? Yep. Okay, uh, good afternoon to you all. Dave Crump, uh, th been called in by AMSAT uh, DL and AMSAT UK initially to look at the wideband transponder and how we might make best use of it. Uh, as Graham said, 8 meg linear transponder. 8 megs seems like a lot of bandwidth if you're into narrowband, but if you're not running normal DVBS2 or DVBS, that's only about five channels you could squeeze into that. However, we've been doing work on 146 megs where we've been getting TV into 500 kilohertz or even less. And we reckon you could get 32 moving picture channels in there. They won't be perfect, but you can get 32 in there. Um, uplink, Graham's already discussed. On the downlink side, the narrowband transponder is vertical. Um, the wideband transponder is horizontal, so you'll need the other voltage on the LMB, that's the 18 volts on the LMB, to get it. Transmit is unchanged, right hand. The sort of figures we're thinking about is about a 1.2 meter dish with 50 watts will guarantee you get in the uplink and something like a 90 centimetre dish for downlink. But really, until the thing's there, we don't know. One, I'll take the question now. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, uh, that would be 50, is that 50 watts for the wideband DVB rather than the very narrow band? Uh, that's for a, about a one mega symbol sig signal, okay. so a, a, a wide-ish signal. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Right, so to bring some sort of order to this 8 megs transponder, we've come up with a provisional band plan. I say provisional because we really don't know how this is going to work, but we think this will. On the left hand side there, the lowest frequency, um, the AMSAT DL team are going to put a beacon up there uh, running DVB-S2, 2, 2 2.4 mega symbols HD. And this is the showcase beacon. Here is an amateur satellite. This is the sort of stuff we're doing with it. And that will be great for aligning your dish if you haven't already done it. In the early days, that's probably going to be 24-7. But I will be encouraging them to turn it off or put it on the first five minutes of the hour uh, as soon as we can. The center segment there is for simplex, normal digital amateur TV. We can fit a couple of signals in there. Um, and on the right hand side I'm proposing that we use reduced bandwidth TV. We've got some options there, we can have four 333 kilosymbols. In 333 kilosymbols you can get an HD signal, an HD TV picture that looks really good. Um, I am trying to encourage my German friends that we do not need to w use so much of this precious resource for their beacon but we'll uh, work on that one. Um, we pro provided some guidance in the band plan. You know, keep your transmissions short. It is a limited resource. Keep the content relevant. You know, we don't want uh, pictures of steam engines at steam rallies and things oh. like that. Please. Um, use the minimum power requ required. But remember, you are sharing the power budget with everybody else on the transponder use the minimum bandwidth. And to that end, if you can use DVB-S2 and some of the higher modes like 8PSK, 16APSK, you can squeeze more um, data into less bandwidth. You need a bit more power to do it though. Um, and lastly, keep to the channels and use standard symbol rates and PIDs so that other people can watch it. We have published, and this is an eye test for those at the back, uh, we have published a list of proposed channels with some designators just to give people a starting point. You know, if you're going to transmit this mode, try this channel. There are quite a few variables in the transmission modes. You know, it, it's like 
the narrowband digital mode, you've got FT8, we've got all these odd digital modes. Well, the same happens for TV, but these are commercial uh, standards. Do we use DVBS2 or DVBS? DVBS2 will go slightly better for less power. It's slightly more robust. What modulation do we use? Do we use the simple QPSK modulation, or which you get two bits per about two bits per hertz, or do we go up to 32 APSK where you get more bits in the bandwidth, but you need a little more signal to noise to uh, read it? What symbol rate do we use? We can use, you know, two mega symbols is the highest I reckon anybody in this room should transmit to the transponder. But I think down at 333 kilo symbols, you only need a sixth of the power to get into the transponder. You occupy a sixth of the bandwidth, and I reckon the pictures are quite good enough for what everybody will want in here. You know, we're not showing motor racing. We don't need fast panning with the whole image moving. Uh, what forward error correction do you use? Again, it affects the bandwidth, it affects how much power you need to get the, the signal through. Um, I am probably going to start working with not a lot of error correction, but we'll see how that goes. Lastly, what video encoding do you use? You know, MPEG-2 is simple video encoding, but takes about double the bandwidth of MPEG-4, H.264. <coughs> And H.265 is another step. H.265, though, you need a good Pentium i6 sat there under the bench generating heat to produce your uh, coding. Yeah, so, quick. So, just, just a, a quick thought come question on the error correction. Obviously, from so the UK, we're not too far away from the, uh, the, the footprint. So low error correction, I think it's going to be fine. Going down, though, if you've got somebody in the edge of Brazil trying to read it through a rainforest, yeah, uh, the question is, do, do, do we need to run better error correction for those who have problems with receive? Yeah. Yes, you do. But if you're only sending pictures to a guy in, in, in Germany who's nearer the centre of the beam, you don't. So you'll get a better picture quality by using less error correction. Things to play with. Uh, it's a learning experience. That's why we're doing it. <coughs> Um, I've sort of drawn out some, some modes here that people might want to think about running. You know, the beacon, where I've already said, is going to be DVB-S2. It's going to be high-end. If you're a high-power user, if you've managed to get a couple of Pyro Joe's amplifiers and you've put them in a combiner and you've managed to keep the rain out of it and it, you know, it's all going, uh, you can probably run DVB-S2 at two mega symbols without much error correction. The typical user, though, I would suggest is going to be using one mega symbol, probably using an older encoder which only does DVB-S. Um, uh, but you can put H.264 on it, which gives you reasonable video quality. The smart user, who's not quite spent quite as much on it, but has thought about it, will use 333 kilo symbols. So they're only using half a meg's bandwidth. They'll use DVB-S2. They'll use 32 APSK, so they're getting the maximum amount of data into that half meg uh, without a lot of error correction and with good video coding. And the low power, low, low budget user at the other end of the spectrum, we're talking about 125 kilo symbol video coding, so you don't need that, very, that much power, but you're getting a picture all right, it's 160 by 140 pixels, but that's still a reasonable moving picture. You know, it's not much more than four or five lines um, at 15 frames per second. You know, you're getting a moving picture to your friend, friend the other side of the world, entry level. We've got all these different transmission settings, but setting your receiver is quite a problem. Quite often you need to enter, you certainly need to enter the frequency, you probably need to en enter the symbol rate in there. So how do you know what to set? We, uh, a joint effort between AMSAT UK and British Amateur Television Club, we're going to stand up a, uh, a web server that will give you a spectrum view of what's happening on this uh, transponder. 
and also a chat window. So you can say, what is the signal at 10495 megs? Does anybody know? Or hopefully, the way we'd like it to work is I say, JGKQ transmitting at 10495, 333 killer symbols, 78 FEC. And then you can put those in. I'll talk more about the, uh, the spectrum view in a moment. Dish, as large as you can get away with. I would like to have Brian's 3.7 meter, but wouldn't even fit in my garden. Um, about 1.2 meter for transmit, if you're going to be serious about this, and about 80 centimeters for receive. Or use a dual feed, a dual feed. PA, you want to look for a minimum of about 20 watts of clean digital. So that is not a PA that is spec to do 20 watts CW. That's a PA that is spec to do about 100 watts CW. Because this digital signal, you put it in there, you'll just get loads of Intermod products on there if you run it at the top level. Um, on the receive side, use a, an Octagon LNV. But remember, it's going to be on the horizontal. So you're either going to have to put 18 volts on it or turn it through 90 degrees and put 12 volts on it. And then you need to put 18 volts on it for the narrowband. Receiver options. Yes, you can use a free-to-air satellite receiver. But with one exception, free-to-air satellite receivers only go down to one mega symbol. So you're limited to the larger bandwidth signals there. You'll also need some sort of frequency converter because the output from the LNB is at about 745 megs and most of these satellite receivers only go down to 950. So you need to mix that up into the L-band, the 1 to 2 gig region. The other option is you can use a mini tuner. Now this, see, we've been using this in satellite TV, uh, sorry, in amateur TV for quite a while. This is a USB tuner, um, a, a normal satellite tuner with a USB interface that goes to the PC. And then on the PC, you can put in the <coughs> settings of frequency, symbol rate, and it covers the full band from 144 megs all the way up to 2600 megs. So you don't need a down an up converter to use with that. <coughs> Uh, BATC have available a kit of hard to use parts for that and that's £50 and a bit of through hole construction. <coughs> really easy to make so I'd recommend you get one of those. Transmit wise, how do you transmit this TV stuff? Well you can go to SR Systems in Germany and buy their hardware. You can, or you can use the software-defined radio approach. You can use um, DATV Express software, which runs on a PC. Again, free software done by Charles G4GO. Thanks, Charles. He's watching. Um, and that will drive either a DATV Express hardware, which are no longer available, unfortunately, a Lime SDR, which many of you will have sat on the shelf waiting for something to do, or a Pluto which another section of you will have sat on the shelf. Mm -hmm. From those, you get about but one to five milliwatts. And you can feed those into your narrowband tran transverter or straight into a, pay a PA. The other option is you go down the Raspberry Pi route using the Portsdown software that I've been developing with the BATC. And that will drive either the, the Portsdown filter modulator board which you're probably best at then running at 144 or 437 and up converting into the band. Uh, or it'll drive a DATV Express, it'll drive that at 2405 megs straight into your PA, or a Lime STR. Does not yet support Pluto. If anybody can help me make it support Pluto, be glad to try. That will then go into your narrowband transverter or PA. Okay, last couple of slides. I men mentioned the Web SDR and Spectrum Monitor. Jointly funded by BATC and AMSAT UK, but the best thing about it is Goon Hilly have offered to host it, so we get their building. Um, 
It's a very small dish as far as Goon Hilly are concerned. They said, we won't even give it a number because it's too small. <laughs> <laughs> but there you go. Um, and they're providing power and internet for us, which is great. We're really pleased with that. Uh, we've got a dual LMB on it with two cables down for uh, narrowband and wideband. And those uh, go into the... One of them goes into the web SDR, uh, which is just like the web SDR at Farnham except a slightly different configuration. It will show the 250 kilohertz of the narrowband transponder. And you'll be able to go onto this from your PC or your smartphone or your iPad and tune and listen to the, demodulate the sideband or the CW or whatever modes are on there. So a really good window onto what's happening onto the satellite and useful for outreach in that you can tell people, here you are, you can go onto this satellite and you can listen to radio amateurs around the world. For the wideband side of things, this is what started us off on it. We need a spectrum monitor so we can see what's happening on here. So this will be a web-based spectrum monitor. On here, um, you can see, this was something, a simulation I set up. You can see there are two large wideband signals on the left-hand side and in the middle there. And then we've got three of the narrowband signals. Um, and one of the things I was looking at is how good are our receivers in picking out the narrowband signals from the wideband. We, you know, those were actually about 20 dB apart. We had no, no trouble dis uh, decoding that one, for example. Um, but on the right hand side here, the chat window. So you can ask questions about what the signals are to uh, do your settings. Technically, on inside the shack uses uh, two air spies. Uh, those are the two air spies there. We talked about putting DC up to your LNB. That's a very simple bias T there. Um, there's a, the rest of the stuff in there is uh, GPS reference and uh, power supply. Not yet online. Um, the, the, the hardware is built, we're perfecting the software and uh, the network configuration, but we, have, we are fairly confident it will be there before the transponder is in service. Lots of people involved in this. Um, AMSAT DL primarily, but with Qatar Amateur Radio Society as well. There is more and more information going online now. Uh, AMSAT DL have stood up their um, information page and linked off that page is a forum for discussion. Also on the BATC forum, the second web link there, there is a dedicated forum to S. Hale. Uh, well worth a look at uh, what people are saying on there and we expect that to get a lot busier. And, of course, there is some, some also some information on ANSAT UK. Right, quick run through, and Graham and I will now both take questions. <laughs> yes, just, just one, bit of, one bit of additional information. Um, unlike most amateur satellites, which they get launched and they switch on very quickly, and we all like getting the first signals. What normally happens with broadcast satellites is that they are launched, but they don't go straight to their final position in the sky. There, there is a fairly long, maybe two or three months commissioning pro, uh, process that's undertaken off, off its final position. So what, although we're getting really enthusiastic and excited about the launch, we will probably have to be a bit patient for a, a few months two or three months maybe, whilst they do the final commissioning and hand over and move it to 26 East. So, although it's probably going to be launched before Christmas, I don't think we're going to get the Christmas present that we're all looking for for the transponder to be switched on in time for our holidays. I but I'm, I may be being overly pessimistic. Uh, yes, questions, please. Thank you. Quite a few years ago, there was an instance of a, a organization, I think based in South America, using amateur satellites for commercial purposes. 
and uh, I think it's about getting pictures back from Antarctica or something. My memory fails me slightly. With this system, it's just so open and stationary that one can see that you know several organisations, the footprint's so big, could say, hey, we can set up a little commercial TV station using this transponder in Africa or something like that. I mean, has, has consideration been given to this? What would happen if it were to come to fruition? Yeah. And is there anything we can do about it? We basically, we have a plan. The initial plan is to deny them use of the part of the transponder they are trying to use. And then we escalate. But we do recognize that there is a very big risk. Uh, but it's, an, it's the same risk as any other transponder runs on a commercial satellite. Yeah, questions from uh, from the internet, I think. From the stream. Uh, from the yeah, question from Charles. Um, are other uh, encapsulated modes within DVD frowned upon, like transmitting G GSE or DPS2? We are in encouraging that the transponder be used for TV purposes. Uh, on Wednesdays, we are proposing that the transponder be used for other experimental modes and that's where we would like to see more experimentation there but for day-to-day -day use for TV. Okay, and there's a hand up at the back but I can't see the face. Oh, Hello. Mike, Mike. Uh, you <coughs> shout and we'll repeat. Okay, the, the question was uh, that the link budget seems to have been decided by noise floors rather than intermodulation from signals. And do we, have we done the calculations? At present, we don't think there will be an issue from intermod on the wideband transponder um, given the difference between the signal levels with the diff difference between the maximum signal that's readable and the lowest signal that is reasonable due to noise floor, we don't think intermod is going to be a significant player there. I must admit, I haven't looked at the narrowband transponder at all. Right. But another learning experience, I think. Any more? Just don't transmit too much power and then you won't create intermods. Uh, and that's easy question to say. from Andy at the back. How stable is the onboard LO? <laughs> the, que the question is how stable is the onboard LO? Jeffrey Boycott. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we have no knowledge, I'm afraid. So one of the early tests, no doubt, that you, would let, you will enjoy doing is measuring that. Yeah, we don't know. Get, any any get, other questions? Getting information, technical information about the satellite has been difficult. Okay. No? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's say thank you very much, Graham and Dave. That's appreciated.